Hello there, and welcome back to my video series where I am reading out my doctoral research into sex and gender as sources of heterogeneity in British political attitudes and behaviors. We are now into chapter two, and in the last video, I gave some perspective historical context for the discovery of gender as um, a more complicated phenomenon than had been previously thought before the 1970s again linked up with second wave feminism time frame we see that in the 1970s psychologists in uh, I think particularly in the United States these these two that I cite a lot Spence and Helmerich were located um, investigating the more multi-dimensional nature of gendered perspectives and I wanted to use one of these measures of gender in my study to try to provide something more complicated than just the dichotomous biological variables of men and women. I wanted to also see whether or not if you included measures of more gendered measures into a study if the sex variable would remain statistically significant. So in this section what I'm doing, going to be doing is explaining why I chose the measures that I did for incorporation into my survey and also the recent research I found that uh, that kind of tipped the scales in, in its favor of the personal attributes questionnaire by the improvement of the scale by some researchers in the United States. So this is going to be pretty stats heavy and if there are important statistical concepts as I did in the last one I will sort of step out of this, the role of reader and go into the role of lecture and give you a little bit of context for the statistics that I'm presenting and how they can be interpreted. And you can always of course check these uh, on the internet to make sure that I'm telling you the right information but um, I, I, I am. <laughs> so if you need further explanation uh, there is the internet to help but I will try to just give you a quick summary of the important statistical concepts and and how to interpret the numbers based on the, what evidence is presented. So on to chapter 2. Selecting the measures. Having established the measures and method for the direct measurement of gender for my investigation, the personal attributes questionnaire measures, it was necessary to narrow down the measures from 24 to a more reasonable number. This section below reviews a publication which informed and influenced my selection of measures from the subsection of the 24 original personal attributes questionnaire measures. The article, fortuitously released a few months before the study was designed, Measurements of Agency, Communion, and Emotional Vulnerability with the Personal Attributes Questionnaire was written by Ward, Thorne, Clemens, Dixon, and Sanford, was used not only as a guide for which measures were to be included into the survey, but also as a resource for the interpretation of the measures as interval level, level and not simply as categorical variables. And briefly stepping out, an interval level, an interval level measure is one that has unique has steps to it. So age in years is an interval level measure because every year you get one year older so it's one step up. Whereas a category does not necessarily have discrete units of difference. For instance being a democratic supporter, supporter or an independent or a republican they're just categories in name. They're also called nominal variables in statistical analysis. And when it comes to engaging in more sophisticated statistical techniques Interval level variables are better at estimating the amount of change for one unit change in the independent variable uh, on the dependent variable. So it is preferred to have interval level measures if you have them when engaging in statistical analyses. Ward et al. also provided more gender neutral terminology for the PAQ measures, which I incorporate and will later argue are better terms to capture the concepts. Uh, of the personal attribute questionnaire measures. One moment. <coughs> the work of Ward et al. informs this thesis in two ways. The primary purpose of the article by Ward et al. was to evaluate the internal consistency reliabilities of the PAQ measures through the use of confirmatory factor analysis, or CFA. Using a sample of college students, num the number of which was 382, they tested the PAQ gender measures analysis that should produce a three-factor solution, the M masculine scale, two the feminine or F scale, and three the MF masculine feminine scale. By examining the results, Ward et al. determined that the three MF items had small loadings, two of which were not significant. 
They then assigned those measures as misspecified and remo removed them from further analysis. After removing the misspecified items and conducting further analysis, they found indications that two F scale items were misspecified. Those two measures were also eliminated and reanalysis showed that the fit indices for the models were improved. Finally, they examined two M items for potential cross-loadings and found two M items, one of which they removed and another which they retained because although it did load on the MF scale, the loadings on the M scale were sizable, standard loadings 0.47. The final goodness of fit tests were significant and an improvement over the original scores. After they removed the six misspecified items and once again conducted analysis with another sample of college students, N. 230, they found the scores were an improvement on the original sample results. Using their no scales, they found, quote, the resultant scales were well correlated with the original scales and differentiated men and women as well as the original scales. Eliminating one item for, for the M scale and two items from the F scale did not alter the internal consistency reliabilities of the two scale scales and removed removal of three misspecified items from the MF improved reliability." Unquote. Ward et al. also concluded that the MF scales, which they relabeled emotional vulnerability measures, were more effective in differentiating between men and women than any of the other PAQ scales. They also stated that, quote, M, I'm sorry, EMV could be useful for explaining sex differences in other behaviors, for instance, interest, attitudes, preferences, and abnormal behaviors." Unquote. Up until this point in this thesis, little has been said about the emotional vulnerability measures which are contained within the PAQ. This is, in part, because the M scale, agency scale, maps onto characteristics associated with masculinity, and the F scale, communion scale, maps onto characteristics associated with femininity. It is these two scales, M and F, which are used in combination to produce Spence and Helmrich's 1978 categories of masculine, feminine, androgynous, and undifferentiated. Adding information about an individual's emotional vulnerability does not add additional information about an individual's gender perspective. It only, only that individuals rate high or low on emotional vulnerability. Less research has been done using the EMV scale, but one study did find that the EMV scale was related to sex differences in response to experimental pain. Ward et al. write, quote, even when sex differences are not the primary focus, it may be important to control for EMV in studies of agency and communion, for example, in relation to mental and physical health. Thus, further research to develop the sex differentiating aspects of EMV seems warranted, unquote. In order to contribute to research into the use of EMV scales when studying agency and communion, my statistical analyses in all future chapters will include the EMV scales as a control variable. For the reasons listed above, the Ward et al. 2006 reduced version of the personal attributes questionnaire was employed in the study for what drives gender differences in political issue preferences. The original 24-item scale and the reduced 18 scale are all attached in appendices A and B. Adopting neutral language. The second element of the work of Ward et al. that informs this thesis is their change in terminology and their accompanying change in the conceptual definitions of behaviors that are masculine or feminine into more gender-neutral terms. As noted above, the ideal woman is characterized by adjectives such as emotional, sensitive, and concerned with others, while the ideal man is said to possess the characteristics of competitiveness, being active, and independent. Yet, as has also been noted, these idealized characteristics can exist in varying degrees within individuals regardless of sex. These traits can be labeled with terms that accurately reflect the degree to which these characteristics can be possessed by both men and women, terms that carry far fewer implications than the terms masculine, feminine, or even androgynous. The use of words like masculine or feminine have wider associations than those terms suggested by the PAQ gender measures, and could be easily misunderstood as referring to displays of human sexuality. Another reason to divorce the gender measures from sexualized labels is that, since their development in the 1970s, the M, F, and MF scales of the PAQ have not only been applied to assess masculinity and femininity in gender, role, and sex research, sex differences 
research, but the same survey questions have been used to measure the concepts of agency and communion, and also as measures of instrumental or expressive traits. Ward et al. chose to rename the factors of the revised scales to agency using the measures of the M scale, communion using the F scale feminine measures, and emotional vulnerability based on the MF scale. In this thesis, I follow their example, and from this point onward, we'll talk about the psychological dispositions of male and female respondents in terms of their self-rating on agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, rather than describing behavior as masculine or feminine. There are several advantages in doing so. It should be noted that this thesis is an exploratory and descriptive empirical investigation into political attitudes and behaviors that focuses on the explanatory effects of sex and gender. Very little has been said about broader feminist theory or the normative implications of feminist critique in these areas because this research is not about feminism per se. However, as this investigation deals with issues of sex and gender, it is appropriate to consider relevant contributions of feminist theory and feminist critique, and one of the many consequences of feminism has been an evaluation of the use of language in our society. It is undeniable that the terms fat masculine, feminine, androgynous, and undifferentiated carry normative as well as descriptive connotations. Although people may describe the ideal woman as characterized by a commitment to caring for the well-being of others, a man who is committed to the common good and taking care of all the members in his society might not think of his values as being feminine. Likewise, an independent, self-assertive woman may resent the wider implications of being labeled as masculine and its connotations with being manly in the biological sense of the word. This thesis is an investigation into the explanatory effects of sex and gender on political attitudes and behavior, but I suggest here that the best way of discussing the effects of gender is to use terms for gendered perspectives which do not th themselves imply sexual norms. I suggest that the description of someone as highly agentic or communal or even emotionally vulnerable is more neutral than the use of terms highly masculine or highly feminine. Taking on board the critiques of feminism with regard to the normative implications of language, I have adopted the neutral terms Ward et al. applied to their revised scales. Conclusion In the last 50 years, Western society's understanding of what gender is has undergone significant transformations. Most of, for most of human history, what was considered socially appropriate for an individual was dependent upon their biology and subsequent sex role. Societies have valued independence, assertiveness, and competitiveness in men, and passivity, nurturing, and compassion in women. Norms for the appropriate behavior for both men and women have been challenged and reconceived, undoubtedly as a result of the activities of and reactions to feminist critiques, combined with women's increased access to higher education, increases in their legal and economic autonomy, and changes in the assumption about what are appropriate sex roles. In psychology, researchers have moved away from an assumption of the unity of sex and gender represented by a bimodal distribution with men and masculine traits on one end and women and feminine traits on the other. Empirical investigations have shown that men and women possess both masculine and feminine traits to varying degrees and that the various aspects of gender behavior cannot be captured with the simple dichotomous variable of sex. This chapter has reviewed the process by which gender measures were selected and incorporated into the Internet survey on understanding gender as a driver of political attitudes and behaviors. The justification for the selection of the personal attributes questionnaire was given, as well as a review of recent analysis which reduced the number of measures and improved the survey instrument. Links between the measures of masculinity and femininity and the ideas of an individual's sense of agency and communion, terms that will be incorporated throughout the rest of this thesis, were also given. The next chapter will explain the construction of the Internet Survey Instrument and review the method used to determine which of the PAQ questions were selected. It will also evaluate the performance of the measures in an Internet survey through the use of confirmatory factor, confirmatory factor analysis, actually that's wrong, it's exploratory factor analysis, elaborate on the other questions used in the survey, and enumerate the hypotheses which will be tested in later chapters. And that is the end of, cha of chapter two. Again, the goal of chapter two was to provide context for the idea of gender as measured in my survey and how I selected the measures I did and their internal reliability. In the next chapter, I'm going to explain the internet survey itself 
how it was developed, and um, the performance of the measures as a result of when we conducted the analysis and got access to the data. So if you are still interested, um, one, you're a total geek and, and a total nerd, and I totally respect you for that. Uh, welcome to the club. And other than that, all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy stretching in the background. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention. I can't believe you're actually listening to this, and I'll see you later. Okay, uh, let me just find a way to f let me find the stop button, and then I can say goodbye.